now introduce our speaker at long last. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I know you guys are probably already thinking of your questions and getting ready to add them to the chat so we can ask them of Laura. Um, we'll also have representatives from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, Jeff Jowett and Janet Popolevsky um, will be on hand uh, in case you have any sort of sewer district specific questions. Although tonight we're really help, hoping to learn about sort of, you know, a lot of experience across the nation and, and um, the things that Laura has been sort of instrumental in creating across our, our nation. So uh, Laura is a practicing fisheries and water resource engineer specializing in ecological restoration for aquatic systems. Her expertise and passion centers on the restoration of rivers through the reestablishment of natural functions and aquatic connectivity. She is considered one of the foremost national US experts on barrier removal and alternative fish passage techniques, regularly lecturing, instructing, and publishing on these topics. She is published in books and journals, and her work was recently featured in the following documentaries, Undamming the Hudson River, Dam Busters, and Veins on Nature about the Lul or Lule River in Sweden. Her work emphasizes reconnecting communities to rivers and the socioeconomic complexities in the balance between resource management and healthy river systems. I think we know something about that here locally. She has been involved in hundreds of river restoration, barrier removal, and fish passage projects throughout the US, both as a licensed professional engineer and as a nonprofit project partner when she was the chief engineer at American Rivers. Laura received her bachelor's in civil engineering from the University of Vermont, her master's of environmental management from Yale University, and has conducted two years of postgrad work at the University of Southampton in England, focusing on international issues relating to the removal of dams and the restoration of aquatic connectivity. Laura integrates both engineering and a deep understanding of river science into her restoration work. So Laura, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen and we will see if this works well. Let me know if and when, hold on, I want to put it in the right mode here. Okay. Okay, which, which view? Can you see the full screen view right now? Yes. Or my yes. notes view? Okay, good, excellent. Okay, well, I'm here to give you hopefully a pretty brief uh, talk so that we have time for questions because that really is where we get more uh, learning done, I think, in that kind of interactive way. And we're going to talk a little bit about dams, rivers, and people and some of the, uh, the drivers relating to dams and the conflict that's going on on the um, intersection of these three things for quite some time. So first of all, I wanna start by talking about way, way back when history. We have been building dams for a very, very long time. Um, we actually, I, I believe you see this little boy uh, building this dam in the river. I, I think it might be in our genetic code. Uh, there is actually a document uh, from 1780 BC here um, that I'm sharing with you that really talks about like dam safety. It's like dam safety regulations from way back, although it says, Something, it's one of the earliest translated documents. It says, um, if anyone be too lazy to keep his dam in proper condition and doesn't keep it, um, if then the dam break and the fields be flooded, then shall he in whose dam the break occurred be sold for money. I'm not quite sure if that means he is gonna be sold for money or his land. Uh, and the money shall replace the corn in which he has caused to be ruined. So even back when they were having problems with keeping dams maintained, uh, keeping responsibility for dams that had been built. And then we see from far back too, we've been removing dams and also dams have been breaching. So we have an example from somewhere between um, two, uh, what's that, 27 and 26,000 BC, um, 
a large dam that they found that breached during that time. And they believe that this dam was, it was in Egypt. They believe it was only there for a few years before it breached because not a lot of sediment had built up behind the dam. So obviously they may be built bigger than they were able to at the time. Also in uh, 331 BC, Alexander the Great, we have a record of him going through the Valley of the Tigris and removing all the dams on the way such that he could get his ships through the valley. In colonial times in the US, what we ended up doing is we ended up taking a lot of the rules that were in Europe and started applying them over here. Uh, during early colonization. And one such rule was like the King's Gap rule. And basically this English rule said that you need to keep the river free of obstructions so that a well-fed three-year-old pig could stand sideways in the stream without touching either side. I love how descriptive that is. Uh, maybe a little subjective on what a well-fed pig uh, is, what big it was. But basically, they're basically saying you have to keep a path by which the fish can get through no matter what. So if you're going to put a dam up, it has to be something like this. You'll notice on this particular dam, it has stop logs below. So you could pull those stop logs seasonally and allow for the fish migration and then put them back in to do whatever it is you were doing. Um, we had fish acts in all of our states and all of our, our early colonies, again, reflective of what was going on in Europe. And those fish acts then slowly transitioned over to the mill acts, actually kind of superseded by the mill acts. So basically we had these fish acts, but then we had these mill acts when we started putting dams and mills on the rivers. And since the mills were also important to the whole community, uh, for things like grinding grain and things like this. They had these acts to protect the mills as well. At the first, fish acts were quite a bit stronger. And then the mill acts kind of started superseding the fish acts. And we had a lot of conflict uh, from way back when. We had the farmers arguing uh, the public rights to the fisheries and complaining about the flooding of their land. And we also had the dam owners coming in and kind of this new economic individualism and basically uh, mills transitioning to the start of the industrial revolution and no longer really looking at rivers in that same public trust way that we did prior to that. And the dams, like I said, they started as primarily mill dams, uh, small mill dams that were often, like I said, open seasonally. So they still allowed for fish passage and fish runs to continue. Um, these were often things, like I said, grist mills used by the whole community. Then we started seeing diversion and navigation canals. One thing I find fascinating is a lot of dams fed um, diversion canals that then fed, fed multiple industries within a town. So you'd have one dam, but you might have you know, 20 different um, mills or industries using that water for diversion. Then we see the industrialization. Now we start building dams that are more permanent, that don't have the seasonality, that block the rivers more significantly and often came with a lot of pollution associated with them too. We started treating our rivers a little bit more like sewers, the famous um, um, uh, Cuyahoga River catching fire. And that was not uncommon. That was not just Ohio. I mean, we had rivers here in Connecticut also catching fire from industrial waste. And then we started seeing hydroelectric dams. So instead of the mechanical power of the old mills, we saw the, the turbines and the hydroelectric dams and flood control dams and all sorts of other kinds of dams as we see this transition of more and more dams on our landscape. We saw a peak for the mill dams um, basically around the turn of the century in the 1800s uh, to the mid 1800s. That's when we had a peak of mill dams. But then by the next turn of the century in the 1900s, a lot of those had been closed. Those were no longer being used. And we saw our big dam building error really starting in kind of the 1950s to the 1970s. These were a lot of the larger dams out west. Now, as I said, early dams were often open seasonally or they attempted to put fishways on them. These are some very old um, fishways that were built a lot of times out of timber. Um, these were not very successful, but again, 
These dams were being put on active fish runs, so they had to be thinking fisheries right off the bat. And there were some really famous battles. I've written some papers on these battles and I could talk for hours on them, but I'll tell you one of my favorite ones, the Bill Ricca Dam in, uh, on the Concord River in Massachusetts. It was constructed in 1710, it had its first lawsuit the next year and it lost. Then it had multiple lawsuits and it kept on being uh, taken out and then rebuilt and then taken out and then rebuilt and then repaired, then raised, then lowered and all these different uses. And even today, we are still talking about the Bill Ricca Dam. Now, in one of those legal battles, um, Henry David Thoreau was involved in it. He was the local surveyor um, that was going to help the farmers try to get this dam removed. And he wrote about 30 years earlier to that. He was out on the river, and you kind of got the feeling of where he stood on this. He said, mere shad, that's a type of fish, mere shad, armed only with innocence and a just cause. I, for one, am with thee. And who knows what may avail a crowbar against that Bill Ricca Dam. In that same court battle, this is one of my favorite quotes from the lawyer now, uh, Henry French. He said, for generations, a painful and expensive controversy has existed in relation to the Bill Ricca Dam. And if not removed now, the children and children's children of these parties will be cursed with strife and contention. And as I said, this is still a discussion going on now, whether to keep the Bill Ricca Dam or to remove the Bill Ricca Dam. And we are still cursed with strife and contention in our country in general because of these conflicts between dams and rivers, and fish and people. Um, these folks here wanna keep their dam. So they made a calendar, got all naked in it with strategically placed sandbags to raise money to repair their dam. Then you see people leaving signs who are very pro keeping their dam. And we have people, oh, I had the same thing happen as you. I am now stopped on it. So how did you fix it? It's not moving forward. Okay, I'm going to, oh, there, now it came up for some reason. Um, and now we have people still willing to get naked to protect rivers and, and try to stop dams from going in or protest. We have a, a war dance going on to protest the Shasta Dam back when it was going on. We have a lot of dams in this country, a lot. You know, we have so many dams in this country that we don't know how many dams we have in this country. The National Inventory of Dams has about 91,457 is what they have. I checked just the other day, that was their number. But these are only larger dams for the most part, above 25 feet or above six feet with a really large impoundment. Then if you look at some other barrier inventories that include the state inventories, um, you get up to around 202, um, well, you see the number right there, thousand stream barriers on one inventory, but really tons and tons of dams are not even included in any of these inventories. We're likely um, closer uh, to a million or so dams, if I were to guess, in this country. And here's the issue. Our dams are aging. This is infrastructure. These aren't waterfalls. This is infrastructure. Uh, and we're not doing a very good job of maintaining our dams. So this is just one chart here from the Association of State Dam Safety Officials that shows over time the number of high hazard dams identified in need of remediation. Now a high hazard dam doesn't mean it's about to breach. A high hazard dam means that if it were to breach, it could cause loss of life. So just looking at the high hazard dams in our country, the ones that could cause loss of life, we have a steady increase in the number of dams that need to be fixed and remediated. And then that, that's the blue lines. And then the green down there is what we're fixing. So pretty small in comparison. And the reason I've adjusted that line at the end is because those last few years, they didn't include some of the data from the state inventories. That's why you see kind of a drop and then an inclining. But I think it's a pretty steady incline. So we're not keeping up with repairs. Um, you know, we have deficient dams are increasing faster than repairs. And we also have states switching over to ownership responsibility, uh, requiring that the owners of the dams do the inspections. 
this becomes an issue because most of our dams in our country are privately owned. So about 63% of our dams are privately owned and people are pretty surprised when all of a sudden the price tag for dam repair falls on them. Right now, we are estimating that we need $70 billion just to repair and maintain the dams that already exist in this country. So we have some really difficult decisions to make. And just like I have two pictures of, I have a picture of a deficient dam here, and then a picture of a, a building. Just the same way we make these decisions for aging buildings or aging bridges, we have to make these four dams as well. We have to decide which kind of path we need to go to move, move forward. Are we gonna repair it or remove it? Uh, this is from TV. This is from um, uh, John Oliver. I liked his comment. He said, infrastructure is like Legos. Building is fun, destroying is fun, but a Lego maintenance set would be the most boring toy in the world. And he used a different statement right there in the middle. He goes, it comes built, then you maintain it. And if you do everything right, nothing happens and you eventually die. I thought that's pretty good. We are excited when we're building things. You know, we have these opening events when a dam is built or a bridge is built or a building is built, but maintaining is not our strength and especially uh, infrastructure. We are not maintaining it well uh, because no one thinks that's exciting and no one puts enough money towards it. And we don't have a lot of bored children who can look over our dams. Now, earthen dams, I want to point this out too. All dams can be difficult to maintain, but earthen dams are especially difficult to maintain. I was once at a dam safety conference with about 300 dam safety officials in the audience. And the speaker got up and he said that an earthen dam starts failing the day you finish construction. And everyone in the audience just like agreed. And here's why. Because earthen dams have water pressure behind them. They're made obviously of earth and they have a water table, the groundwater table, basically that, uh, that water pressure going through the dam. And I, I drew that on here, this kind of light blue that you see going through the dam. And that, when it goes through, it takes out fines from the earthen dam. So you get all sorts of problems with seepage and lack, uh, loss of material. Um, and then you get things like um, blocking, and you get this on all dams, blocking of like spillway capacities or this livestock damage or these burrows from the animals. But earthen dams, especially when they have these kind of structural problems with them, they can have a tendency to then overtop. And once an earthen dam overtops, it often fails. So it, it fails through this kind of seepage and loss of material fails from overtopping, and then all these other things that affect the uh, structural integrity of an earthen dam. And on the uh, Ohio Dam Safety website, they, they point this out and they show some examples. And here you can see the failure of an earthen dam, both in the progress of failing, but also now you see this cross section through it. Now, some earthen dams have central core walls, but a lot don't. And even a core wall doesn't always save it. So, uh, earthen dams are especially prone to uh, failure. Dams also have impacts on our river systems. And we're just gonna run through these kind of quickly. Uh, some are pretty obvious. The first thing is you put a dam in and you stratify um, the water back behind and you can get these different zones. They can have different oxygen levels. You get increased evaporation. Uh, you get increased temperatures within the impoundment that can affect the temperature regime downstream as well. You get decreases in water circulation and water quality, depletion of oxygen levels, often the creation of algae blooms. These decreased water quality issues also get transported downstream. You get nutrient starved conditions downstream. And you can alter the flow regime downstream that's needed to keep kind of the river system healthy. And then it also blocks nutrient that's going downstream, these habitat building blo um, blocks and traps sediment because rivers transport both water and sediment. That gets blocked behind the dam as well. And you start getting pollutant accumulations in the sediment. You can create sediment starved conditions downstream where you actually get additional erosion because you've taken the sediment out of the system. 
And then of course it blocks aquatic organism, primarily fish, but others as well. So when you remove a dam, you're kind of reversing these processes. You're getting back to a more natural uh, habitat and stream bed features. You're getting back to that turbulent flow pattern, restoring natural temperature regimes uh, and natural sediment transport and allowing debris and nutrients to move downstream and aquatic organisms to pass. And these impacts of dams are cumulative. So the more dams you put on a system, the higher these impacts are. Uh, and we got to the point where we're really seeing that we've stair-stepped many of our river systems. Here's just the uh, lock and dam system on the Ohio River. And you see in that profile down below that you're actually going just from one impoundment to the next impoundment to the next impoundment. Not surprising, of course, with a navigation system because they're looking to do that. But even on these non-navigation system rivers, we've often just stair-stepped them one dam to the next. And this has created a significant decline in our fisheries in the US. I live in an area where we have a lot of uh, diagemous fish species, migratory fish species coming in and out. And we've seen significant declines in this. In the Great Lakes Basin, we've also seen fish declines, especially things that need to move species like lake sturgeon. So you think, well, yeah, but we fixed that, right? We already fixed that. We already came up with a solution to that. We have fishways. Well, first of all, we only put fishways on two to 4% of all of the dams in our country to begin with. But even the fishways we have don't work the way we think they're gonna work always. I always say fishways are kind of like this, like this footbridge in Switzerland. You expect you're gonna pass everything. You're gonna get all different, you know, grandparents out there, kids out there, people with strollers, bicycles, people walking, everything. Everyone's gonna use the bridge. But in reality, our bridge looks something a little closer to this when we're talking about fishways. A few are gonna get past that. Some, the healthier, the ones that can jump from board to board are gonna make it past that. But you're not gonna get all the different species and all the different life stage of, of fish passing a fishway. So they are not transparent uh, aquatic organism passage. There is a lot of difficulties. So what are some of the factors we need to consider when we're making a decision between dams and rivers and people and we're trying to figure these all out? It's all a balancing act. I'm just going to mention a few, a uh, few of the biggies. Safety being really big. The aging of our dams and our infrastructure, reservoir sedimentation, breaching of dams, the drowning potential, especially in low head dams and liability issues. These are some of the things that we consider when we're trying to make decisions on what to do next. We also look at economic issues relating to maintenance and replacement and economic equity. We see a lot of lack of equity in some of the decisions that are made. Um, economic value and purpose of the current dam. What is it doing right now? What economic value does it have? and a discussion of the costs that we do or do not want to pass on to future generations. In addition, we're talking about those environmental impacts, both of the dam, but also if you're considering removal of the removal too. Whereas dam removal has an overall economic benefit, you still have to do it in a way that minimizes temporary impacts when you're taking it out. And we have to discuss things like threatened and endangered species and invasive species. And what does that mean for our decisions? It's a big balancing act. We might have a dam that's unsafe. It no longer serves about, you know, an economic purpose. It's not being maintained. Its impoundment is filling with sediment and it's impacting water quality. But at the same time, on the other side of that balance, it might have beautiful lake views, recreational value, lakefront properties, historic value, or a warm water fisheries that's well loved in the community. So every single project, we're gonna be balancing a, a wide variety of conflicting issues. And we're gonna end up keeping dams that serve valuable economic purposes, you know, active hydroelectric, flood control dams, navigation, water supply. These aren't the dams that we are going to be needing to put the money in to maintain. But we have a lot of dams on our landscape that look a little more like this, that 
have been left for the last 80 to 100 years, have not been used in a long time, are not being maintained, and we have to make some decisions. And more and more, we're choosing a decision where we're removing uh, some of these relic dams that no longer serve an active purpose. And these are just some of the removals that I've been, in, well, actually some that I've been involved in, some that I chose because they were uh, closer to you guys in Ohio. And every time we have a big failure, like the Edenville Dam failure in Michigan, just in 2020, more attention is brought to this issue again, uh, a better understanding of the kind of financial situation and decisions we need to make. Um, and we have a little bit of a silver lining that just happened, uh, funding for both dam repair and dam removal through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, we're hoping this all goes, continues to go through. Uh, if it does, we are looking at the vast majority of it going to transportation. Mm -hmm. But you do see uh, 55 billion in this right now that they have set aside for water infrastructure. That's not just dams, that's all sorts of water infrastructure. That includes both repair and removal. A lot of this funding can also be augmented, especially in the case of dam removal with other funding for ecological restoration. And in the case of repair, sometimes low interest loans offered by the states. And with that, I am going to open it up for questions. Thanks. I think we wanted to start off with folks asking questions in the chat. So if anyone has any that they want to throw in there, um, we we can do it that way. Or you know, if if as Laura and I spoke earlier when we were planning the the meeting, um, we we both like sort of the idea of having a, an open conversation where everyone can feel free to talk, um, you know, and ask questions ad hoc. So Laura, first of all, thank you very much for that really um, thorough, thorough kind of 101 on dams in our country and also for making it fun along the way. Appreciate that. Um, don't know how you made sort of a more dry infrastructure talk, so fun. Um, anyone have any questions? Phenomenal, lots of kudos, lots of... Um... <laughs> I will say this was a very broad talk that I gave here yeah. because we, we wanted to do short, yep. but I am very involved in the technical aspects of dam removal. So if you have a more detailed or more technical question, feel free to ask it as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, one of the things that you know in our community, we've with the with the Horseshoe Lake Dam and the idea that 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 dam will be um, removed because it doesn't create a benefit that is you know related to water um, you know hydrology you know hydropower or um, electricity or any anything uh, irrigation um, you know it's it's makes a lot of sense, but there's still such a, a nostalgic um, view from our community. And I guess I just wouldn't, would be interested in a few of your stories in which, you, you know, you've worked through with communities that you've worked with, you know, kind of the part that's emotional, the heartstrings part. If yeah, you any stories like that. there, you know, it always, often takes me by surprise the ones that have it and the ones that don't because sometimes I'll go out to a site and having been around so many dams in my life um I'll go out and I'll be like oh this one's gorgeous for sure uh everyone's gonna really feel strongly about keeping this dam and on that particular project we'll run into like no issues everyone's like fine no nope, yeah, fine and then I'll go out to another one that is like falling apart no one's been maintaining it I didn't even think someone could see it and all of a sudden you'll have a community say, no, 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 this is really, really important. We love this. So sometimes it doesn't follow rhyme or reason. Um, uh, and sometimes it does. I mean, sometimes you, you can clearly see the historic value. Um, often when you're dealing with issues like that, it's a matter of kind of listening, understanding the concern and trying to hold as coming up with concepts that hold as much of that value as possible. For example, we've done projects where only a portion 
<laughs> of the dam was removed and a lot of interpretive signage was put in mm -hmm. to kind of explain the history um, and really highlight the, the industrial and mill history of the site as well as the history prior to the dam going in. We have taken out dams um, and still had some impoundment behind them, you know, it's taken out uh, a portion or all of the dam and still had some uh, portion of an impoundment still in there. Um, we have discussed the differences between a warm water and a cold water fishery and identified some of the ecological transition that's going to happen and help to get people excited about a more self-sustaining self ecology over the snapshot of the one that they have currently. Um, but we've really gone in and worked with communities and talked to them um, to, to make sure they're listened to, you know, yeah. make sure they're listened to and as much as possible of the, in this balancing act to try to incorporate those concerns. Yeah, I know that this project, um, you know, will will involve two years of planning, and and throughout that there will be uh, opportunities for the community to have input. I know uh, as well on the Cuyahoga River, um, there's there's a a dam that does have part of it, the historic part of it that remains as sort of a almost like a water feature, almost like a, a fountain for the community to. Um, look back. I do have questions coming in. Do you want to um, stop sharing your screen? Sure. Only because yeah. then we can see you a little better. Oh, okay. Um, sure. Yeah. Not, not that I'm sure that's a benefit, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, great presentation. How long does it take post removal for an ecosystem to ecosystem park um, setting to return to full vibrancy? Yeah. Um, Here's the thing, we have a lot more examples now. I mean, I started working on uh, fish passage and dam removal issues in the 1990s, and we had very few good examples and good monitoring. Now we have a lot of dams that have come out and we have a lot of monitoring data. And what we're seeing is certain things like migratory fish, as long as they, um, the species hasn't been extirpated from this um, system entirely, is almost an immediate response. You can get uh, fish coming back up the next migratory system, and you can get riverine fish moving very quickly through the system. So you see a pretty immediate response there, typically. Uh, you might see a slower response from aquatic invertebrates. Uh, that might take more like a year or two. Um, muscle populations are very sensitive to dam removal, so you have to, first of all, do it properly so that you're not impacting them negatively. Um, and then you see a little bit longer uh, term in certain areas, maybe uh, multiple years for a mu muscle population to come back strong. Um, and then uh, the transition of vegetation, it's, uh, you know, sometimes for me, it's interesting, you'll take it out like two weeks later, if you take it out in the middle of the growing season, you're like, it's all green already. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the root mass is really in there. It'll take one or two really good uh, growing seasons to get more root mass in there. And then you'll see a transition of vegetation, depending on if you're managing the site, if you're not managing the site, just managing invasives, a transition where the vegetation starts very low and then can get very high uh, depending on the site. So, so everything has kind of its own time period. I think the best example right now is the Elwa removals and the monitoring that's going on with that. It is amazing how quick they're seeing uh, an, a positive ecological response just you know, right after and a few years after the Elwa. That's removal. the river in Sweden? No, the Elwa, the, that's the Lulea is in Sweden and okay. actually that is horrifically damaged. That's a very sad story actually. Um, but uh, the Elwa River is the uh, really large uh, two dam removals coming off the Elwa River on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. Neat. Um, it was a really big project. We'll have to we'll have to look that one up. Uh, this this is a great question. Can you explain more about the process of removing a dam and what happens with the dredging and sediment rec recreation uh, and the recreation of a channel? 
Sure, I actually have an entire slide that shows the process of dam removal, but it's it's not too quick. So unless you really <laughs> beg me for that one, I won't jump into it right now because it's late and probably like most of you, we all want to get home at some time. But so I'll just kind of verbally talk about it. Uh, sediment's one of the biggest issues associated with dam removal. So managing sediment and determining what you're going to do with it is one of the first things. You go out to these sites, there's a bunch of field work that you need to do, including programming probing and testing so that you can quantify and figure out the quality of the sediment. You're looking at other potential ecological impacts while you're out there too. So it starts with a lot of field investigation and looking at all the different kind of critical issues. In my slide that, that I have those kind of identify those critical issues. Uh, if we keep this presentation, I can run through it at the very end after everyone's left, and then it can be on the recording. How about that? <laughs> and uh, uh, then, then you start identifying these um, permitting requirements. You're looking for showstoppers and, and some of the permitting requirements. So you start really working with the regulators to make sure everything's being addressed, working with the community throughout the whole thing to understand their concerns and make sure that's addressed throughout. And then um, getting the results back on the sediment, making a lot of decisions based on what you can and can't do based on the sediment and the costs. Uh, then we run hydraulic models, um, also to figure out what the water surface elevations are gonna be. We're making sure that we have no adverse impacts on flooding and potentially even beneficial uh, flood attenuation. Um, we go through that entire process, um, uh, do plans, go back and forth with the regulators a lot, look at things like threatened and endangered species and invasive species um, to make a lot of these decisions, to try to minimize any kind of impacts and then go into construction where hopefully we've integrated both monitoring and adaptive management so we can be responsive to what is going on too. Um, and, uh, and again, make the project as, as good as it can get. Yeah, hence the, 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 the timeline of these large projects with all yeah, of Yeah, I've been involved in projects uh, that were decades in the making. Uh, those are really large, like FERC settlement, that's F uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, settlement agreements with multiple dams. Uh, they can be decades. Uh, a lot of the smaller dams, yeah, it's, uh, it's at minimum maybe a year, year and a half, and more commonly maybe uh, two to three years mm -hmm. on the on the smaller, like under twenty five foot size dams. This is all, another great question, um, you know, and and people have we've been discussing the Horseshoe Lake Dam um, for a large part of this year, and um, and one of the thoughtful questions is just sort of what are some of the things if you have experience with it that we as a community that hasn't gone through a dam removal process yet, um, what are some of the unforeseen benefits that we, we don't even know are coming our way um, that we can look forward to, especially for the folks who maybe aren't as enthusiastic as others? <laughs> um, aquatic connectivity in general and, and uh, sustainable river systems in the end is a wonderful thing. So not what, what you don't realize now is kind of that, that financial burden that uh, I'm sure the owners of, of the dam uh, do understand of constantly having to think, how are we gonna take care of this? How are we gonna make it safe? Uh, what kind of costs are we gonna have? What kind of costs to taxpayers? What kind of costs to, to future generations are we gonna have? So, so one benefit is not having that, having a self-sustaining system. Uh, and a self-sustaining ecosystem. So those are some benefits that maybe aren't so obvious unless you're the one dealing with the costs, um, but they're gonna feel that for sure. They're gonna um, know that difference. You're also gonna see on an ecological uh, level, again, that transition to a more self-sustaining system. So to the species that kind of evolved with this river for the thousands and thousands of years before a dam goes in, you'll see benefits to those kinds of species in this system as well. Um, also, again, as long as you're integrating a really strong stakeholder and community process, you can integrate a lot of interesting features in your system. There was one dam um, that I was out to, a dam removal project in Michigan, 
that had been this pond, and I'm sure everyone thought this beautiful, you know, I'm sure that it's a pond, it's a lake, they liked it. And it transitioned over to a community park afterwards. And it's a really good example because, and this one, it had the river running through it, had kind of a natural area, had a manicured area, had a boardwalk where they did an art exhibit, like an outdoor art exhibit along it. Um, and now, and they've integrated so many of the things the community wanted in that, that now when you go down there, you see weddings, you know, you see people skateboarding out there, you see, um, you see people really utilizing this boardwalk system and enjoying it. And you're actually seeing in this case, um, property values increasing because of the amenities of this, this park that is more integrated as opposed to they had a pond before, but the pond was that it was, it wasn't used for fishing at this point because it was mm -hmm. too shallow and full of sediment. It was a visual that they had a view shed that they had. And now it's transitioned to a more active area that's getting more used by the community. So that's potentially, it depends on, you know, how things end up with your particular project, but those are the kind of potential things you might be able to see. Uh, one pretty technical question. I'll take two, two more. So, and then I will, um, and then, I'll, you know, depending on your stamina, Laura, we might be able to open it up, but I think I know that an hour is, is pretty, pretty good length for a zoom call. Uh, but one is a very specific question. It says, can you comment on the significance of Walter and Maris Merritt's legacy sediment hypothesis? for small dams, ponds, and hydrological restorations. Yes, most definitely. Matter of fact, I just gave a whole paper on that and uh, a presentation down at American Fisheries Society. So uh, Walters and Merritts talks about looking at a different type of baseline condition. Um, they talk about the fact that in the region that they're looking at in the mid-Atlantic, more typically this, uh, the rivers um, beneath all the dams, beneath, beneath all the impoundments, we're not single threaded systems, but multi-threaded systems. And that when we look to restore these systems, we have to, we should be thinking along those same lines in complexity and not always just try to restore single threaded systems, but do, you know, look for complexity, look for multi-threaded systems. And they also talk about the legacy sediment that's kind of left on the landscape that where we don't even see a dam anymore, but it's still kind of there. And there's this potential for more complex systems underneath this. Um, I think it is really, really under, uh, really important to understand baseline conditions when you're talking about uh, dams, dam removal uh, and river restoration. So any, uh, dam removal project, I think the whole first thing is the investigation and the understanding of the history and what was there. And then maybe a little different than Walters and Merritt's, understanding the bounds by which we're working under right now. So maybe, for example, uh, Glastonbury, where I live in Connecticut, is legacy sediment, but from a glacial dam way, way back when. And now we built the town of Glastonbury on top of that glacial sediment. So if we were trying to restore a pre-glacial dam, you know, we'd have to take out all of Glastonbury. So that's an <laughs> extreme case, but the same thing with dams. Um, often we can't get exactly back to where things were before the dam was there. For example, in, in Cleveland, obviously there's a lot of infrastructure. There's a lot that's been built so far. So you wanna understand that critical baseline condition that uh, Walters Merritts talks about but you also really want to make sure that you understand your constraints right now too. And how do you get to the most sustainable system you can within those confines? So, um, but I, I have a paper on that and, uh, and there's some other stuff you could read if someone would like to. Okay. Um, I did ask Thomas, Hardy to unmute himself uh, to ask his question. But while he's doing that, I asked that via text. If a downstream section of a waterway has a serious goldfish problem, how might you keep that population from invading the upper waterway once the dam is removed? We have so, that. Okay, that's, 
I, I, I'm going to... I'm going to say I've never run into an actual goldfish problem. Are we talking about like fish tank goldfish or are we talking about koi? Uh, but regardless, if we're yes. talking about either one, um, yeah, uh, let's put it in the invasive species category. Sometimes we have systems and we want to restore connectivity for all those reasons, for, for all the native sp fish species, uh, maybe fish species that um, are from the region, at least, that uh, are beneficial to us. We want to re restore natural sediment transport processes and flow processes and debris movement and everything else through the system. But we have an invasive fish species downstream that could move up when we take the dam out. The most common isn't the goldfish scenario, although it's an interesting one. Um, it is a uh, sea lamprey in the Great Lake. So sea lamprey in the Great Lake, we're trying to manage them and not allow them up in the system, but we want other uh, you know, species to get up there. So it's a hard thing. It's a hard decision. When it's something like sea lamprey, we have to make some tough decisions. And sometimes it means creating fishways that will allow certain fish past and other fish not, or going in and using lamprosides or things like that. But it is a very hard decision when you, for the sake of one invasive species, you manage it by continuing, not just to impact a river system and all the other species on a whole, but pass on these maintenance costs to future generations. So I think there's never an easy answer to that. I think it really has to be discussed and, and decided kind of where you're gonna make your stand. Okay. Hello, if you can hear me, this is Tom Hurdy. And uh, you asked me to unmute myself to ask my question. Uh, basically, I'm a Porridge County Park Commissioner. We have a piece of property that has a dam on it and the dam's deteriorating. And we have the question of what to do with the dam. And there are homeowners who are connected to the dam uh, who are enjoying the, the lake that's part of it. And, and my question is in, in regards to making these difficult decisions to remove a dam, when it affects property owners' values and their lifestyle, um, these are some decisions that we're having to make and it just didn't know if you had any guidance you could offer us. I'll tell you the most common thing I say when asked that question is I believe in lake associations. So when, let's say it's a dam and, and the town's folks, the folks like paying taxes and stuff, aren't benefiting from this dam at all. No, one's, no one has public access to it, or if they do, let's say it's filling in with sediment and whatever, but they, in a sense, are paying the cost for the continued dam maintenance um, because the town has to pay that cost for continued dam maintenance. So if at some point uh, the town community decide that, hey, it's really not worth it for us, we're not getting enough benefit from this, but there are others right around the impoundment that are benefiting from this and they want to keep it. I recommend gathering together in a lake association and understanding the financial costs of dam management and the dam safety and liability issues and make a decision if the worth is high enough for you to all join together and pay for that. I will honestly tell you as much as I, I work on dam repairs, I work on dam removals, but I own a lakefront cabin in New Hampshire that has a dam that augments a natural lake. And we are in a lake association that maintains that, that dam. So um, I, I think if it serves enough value, people will find uh, the money. But I think it's unfair to ask people who aren't benefiting from it to continue to pay for it, and especially next generations. Well, well, thank you very much for that. And maybe in the future, we'll have you come testify for us. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good presentation. You have Great, a good thanks. evening. Sure thing, Tom. Okay. Well, I know that uh, we, you know, are past the hour here. And uh, Laura, thank you again. If we didn't get to your questions uh, for anyone out there, we can stay, we're staying in touch with Laura and we'll follow up also on behalf of the partnership and the sewer district with any specific questions um, to Horseshoe Lake. Uh, we really wanted to bring Laura here because there was so much context uh, and so much to learn from communities that are facing this similar issue as we are on Dome Brook. So it was a huge 
um, opportunity to learn. And we really look forward to many more opportunities to have fun and learn together next year in 2022. Um, you won't, you're not done hearing from us this year. You'll hear, you'll, you'll um, hear from us via the mail and Facebook, especially around Giving Tuesday. Um, but we wish everyone a really safe holiday and uh, appreciate everyone for, you know, being so involved and, and with, you know, giving so much support to this organization. So with that, uh, we will sign off and look forward to seeing you hopefully in some post pandemic um, months ahead. Thanks everybody. Take care.